if, if someone is making promises that seem too good to be true, uh, you know, take that with a grain of salt because um, it may just be the, trying to lead you down the wrong path. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of the Real Estate Investors Club podcast. I'm here with Lambros Demos, who is a real estate broker uh, for a change from Mississauga in the greater Toronto area. He's specialized in property sales in the Toronto area, and we don't often hear from people from Toronto, so I'm excited to dig into a little bit of your business model and also um, just what's happening in Toronto. So by way of introduction, do you want to tell us a little bit about your journey through life that has led you to be sitting here chatting with me today? Wow. Uh, what, that's great. Thank you very much, first of all, for having me on the show. It's an honor to be here and I'm excited as well. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, going back, my, my mother was in real estate, so I've always been familiar with, with the business. Uh, and it's funny because, uh, I mean, obviously I, I look up to my mom and I always uh, perceived it as an admirable business and she was helping people, you know, buy and sell houses. So when I got my license, um, or just before I got my license, when I was studying for it, uh, I, I kept getting a lot of, uh, you know, negative comments and, and things like that. And I was uh, exploring, uh, you know, social media was uh, starting to pick up at that point. Uh, and then I was so surprised to see all the negativity around real estate and how we were perceived uh, something between snake oil salesmen and used car salesmen or something like that. Right. So I was like, wh why? Why? Is I, I had no idea. I was so, so naive at that point. Um, and then uh, I realized it's because uh, of the industry itself. And, uh, you know, so um, so that, that was an eye opener. That was a, really an eye opener for me. Um, and I'm, I'm working my way since then to to change that uh, that perception of our industry. Right. So and it, it starts with integrity, uh, starts with honesty. I mean, I'll tell clients what they need to hear, not not just what they want to hear, uh, et cetera. So, yeah, I, I love that. Yeah, I love that. So tell me right now what's happening in Toronto, because, you know, yeah. we've gone through some major market shifts here in Montreal. We're living through our own slowdown at this point. Like we're yeah. not in, you know, investment is is really at a halt. Uh, home buying is still happening and prices have not come down that much. Okay. But we hear a lot of uh, sort of doom and gloom about Toronto. So tell me what's happening on the ground. There? Yeah, to, to, Toronto is a hub, uh, as is Vancouver. I mean, when, when times were good, those are the two markets that really uh, accelerated. Uh, and the times are bad, they're, they're really coming down. So they're probably at the extremes uh, on both ends. So when things are going well, they go higher. And then when things are going not so well, then they, they take the, the brunt of, of the uh, the impact. So um, Toronto has definitely been hit on average. Uh, it's probably about 25% or so prices have come down since February. Um, but to put that in context, I mean, going back a year, prices went up almost 40%. So all the gains that we've lost are pretty much over the winter time, right? So it's not like house prices are crashing down or anything like that, but it's just a perception. Oh, they were way up there. And now they're, they've come down here, right? So there is some of that. Now they seem to have stabilized a little bit, uh, pretty flat month over month, depending on the market. And it is very market specific. Uh, Detach, for example, uh, have come down very slightly as opposed to, you know, townhomes or condos. Uh, those have actually gone up month over month because they've hit the bottom, it, it appears, and it just back up a little bit, right? So it really depends on the type of uh, pro uh, property that we're talking about here. And uh, again, I mean, every every area is different. So Mississauga would be different from Toronto, different from Brampton, different from Oakville, different from all the, the places uh, all around here. So, but generally speaking, yes, they, they have come, come down quite a bit. Yeah. And what's the experience for people who are looking at buying there? I mean, maybe you can tell me, uh, you know, really quickly about people who are looking at single family homes, but maybe also people who are interested in, you know, investing, whether it's yeah. buying a condo to invest or, you know, buying a duplex or a triplex or something. Yeah. What is the experience that people are having on the ground right now? Yeah, I, I think it's a great time for investors, uh, you know, because there's 
there's much less competition. I would rather buy in this type of market than six months ago or a year ago where there was there was 20 you know, offers for for every one property right you're so you're competing with you know 19 other people uh, for that one property and if you really wanted it that would force your hand to keep bidding up and up and up and up and that's why we saw the, the crazy appreciation we saw 200,000 over asking 300,000 over asking which was the norm uh, at that point right here now at least buyers have options uh, and they have uh negotiation back right so it's not okay asking price is this okay we'll offer this we'll meet somewhere in between uh, the traditional way of, of doing business uh also they they can include conditions so i don't know how it works in montreal but here we put in an offer conditional upon financing or conditional on a home inspection or uh, any other condition uh, that may be necessary uh, which we didn't see uh, during the, the crazy times because in order to compete, uh, you had to drop the condition. So now you're going in blind, not knowing if your lender or your bank is going to approve you uh, and you're hoping uh, that they will. Uh, and also you're going in without a home inspection, so you don't know what you're going to find. Uh, let's say you buy the house, you're happy with it. But after you move in, you discover mold in the attic or all kinds of other issues uh, in there. So. Uh, it, I think this is a really good time for buyers right now. They should take advantage of this market because there is no competition uh, and the power is with the buyer at, at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, and I think, you know, when they when you talk about like, uh, you know, can Canadian immigration statistics, I think it's something like half of all of the immigrants who come into Canada, Canada end up settle, settling in the GTA area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So even though there might be a temporary like kind of hiccup or a blip in what's going on with the market, there's mm -hmm. kind of only one way things are going to go. Long Absolutely. Term. Long term, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in long term uh, investing, especially in real estate. I'm um, a buy and hold type of person. Uh, yeah, prices may be coming down now. Maybe they've come down. They may go down again. Uh, I just got a text message the other day. Oh, I think I'm going to pause my search right now because prices are going to come down. Well, I wish I had his, his crystal ball because I, can't, I don't know what's going to happen. But if he's right and prices do come down, eventually they'll go back up again right uh you know five years from now 10 years from now 15 years from now if you hold it uh it's it's always going to go back up again it's always done that go back as far as you can 40 years 50 years it, it's always there's been some blips yes but the long-term trajectory is always up uh and you just mentioned immigration which is a great point uh, all these people need somewhere to live and most immigrants uh where, where do they live when they first uh, come to a different country they rent right? Um, this is adding to the rental pool. Uh, those buyers who have been priced out of the market are forced to rent uh, as well, uh, and or they have to continue renting, whatever the case may be. So not only are um, it, interest rates going up, which we haven't really talked about, but uh, inflation's up, but rent is going up as well, which I always remind people, especially if they're thinking of investing in real estate, this is a great time to get in the market because rents are going up. Uh, you are posi positioning yourself to really get some great cash flow in an investment property, especially if it's more than two doors, right? So your two doors, three doors, whatever uh, that investment property is, uh, you will get some tremendous cash flow. So is it really realistic to think that you can buy properties that cash flow in the GTA? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there is right now. There's uh, with interest rates up, you know, that that's priced a few people out of the market. But uh, on the flip side of that, uh, home prices have come down. So it's cheaper uh, for the property itself, you know. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. And if you can get access to to the financing, by all means, I would say get in uh, and get a type of property that will allow you more than one um, cash flow opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so let tell me now a little bit about uh, your book. OK, awesome. I'd love to. Yeah, it's called Referral Secrets, uh, How to Build uh, Your Real Estate Business uh, Through uh, Relationships. And uh, but it's not, you know, it's not real estate specific. It's great for real estate agents, uh, but it's not only for real estate agents. So any type of business that you have where uh, you're self-employed and you need to uh, build your business through relationships, th this will help because it gives you some great tips. Uh, I'm one of the authors. There's 22 others. Uh, we're all across Canada and uh, the USA. Uh, so you're getting a, a great resource of uh all, all kinds of experiences and all kinds of uh, great ideas uh, that you can use to uh, to build uh, your business. 
Yeah. So do you want to give us like your top two? I mean, you wrote a chapter in the book, so obviously you know something about this. What would be your <laughs> top two tips that like when someone's done listening to this podcast, they can go out into their life and apply yeah. that? Yeah, I would say, uh, I mean, talk to people is number one, right? Uh, everybody loves social media these days or texting and all that, which is great. I'm not knocking it. But if you want to build relationships, it's got to be face to face, you know, belly to belly, uh, you know, buy a coffee for somebody. You're meeting somebody, say, hey, I'd love to learn more about you, uh, you know, or love to chat sometime. Can I buy you a coffee? Who says no to that? Right. So um, or buy them lunch, whatever, whatever it is, you know, so you just host a mixer, something like that, you know, invite people into your uh, sphere who are related to your business. You know, it could be home inspectors, it could be mortgage uh, lenders, it could be any, any, anything like that, right? And host a little mixer, talk to people, get to know people, and that way you build a referral network that way. So, um, and even if it's out on the street, you know, you see somebody, uh, I know I'm an introvert actually, so it's hard for me to approach somebody and start talking to them. But if I know what I'm talking about and I'm confident in my abilities, then then it makes it a lot easier. So uh, I used to door knock when I first started in in, in real estate. I still do sometimes. Uh, and I prefer that much more over cold calling, right? <laughs> Who likes cold calling, right? You feel like you're selling duck cleaning or something like that. But um, yeah, I mean, and just talk to people when they answer the door. Talk. Some of them won't talk to you and that's fine. Just move on to the next one. Uh, but talking to people is definitely the number one thing uh, I would do. Uh, and number two is get involved in the community somehow. Uh, be seen in the community as a local leader, be seen as someone who gives back, not with an agenda, right? So I'll give you an example. Um, my good friend, uh, who I, is also a colleague, uh, he lost his dad to um, a disease called ALS. I don't know if you've heard of that, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Mm -hmm. um, so we decided uh, a few years back to put together a soccer tournament because not only were we friends, but we also shared a, a love of, uh, for soccer. So we said, you know what, why don't we do something fun? Uh, you know, that we can give back to the community, raise awareness for ALS and raise some money uh, for it. And this was pre the ice bucket challenge. So nobody knew at that point in time what ALS was. Uh, and we had a lot of fun doing it and we raised some money. Uh, but you know what? A funny thing happened. Uh, we made a lot of contacts too along the way and said, oh, you guys are in real estate. Yeah, yeah. But that wasn't the intention, right? So we, we, we wanted to give back to the community, but they saw the, the work that we were doing uh, and uh, it just left from there. We got a few leads from there uh, and we, we got some business uh, from there as well. So it was a win-win all the way around. Mm -hmm. No, I th and I think that's really great advice, especially for, you know, uh, if we could start an introvert support group, like I'm also an introvert, I'm also an <laughs> okay. introvert. Yeah. And yeah. so that business of, you know, like real estate is such a people business. And mm -hmm. if you want to, you know, make a success of whatever route it's that you're going to take, like maybe you it's, is as a broker, but investors, it's exactly the same. Like we have to be networking, we have to be meeting people, not necessarily only to chase deals, but to yeah. understand what's happening in the market to build the power team that's going to help you make a success of your investment because you don't know everything that you need to know yourself. That's right. Um, and so definitely, like I think, uh, you know, in this age when people think that, you know, with your smartphone, you can replace a lot of human relationships. Um, you know, I, I like, uh, <laughs> I'm also not a, <laughs> I'm also, you know, same. I'm not, a, I'm not a, not a millennial, but yeah. like, I definitely think, you know, even if it's just sometimes having a, you know, a phone conversation with someone like oh, with yeah. texting, you can only get so far. And if you really want to like, let the tone of voice, let whatever energy it is that you have come through it, the best way to do that is in person. And if Absolutely. you can't in person, then zoom. And if you can't zoom, then make a phone call as That's opposed right. to, you know, messaging or sending some like thing over instagram it's fine to say hi how are you but that's not a way to build and nurture relationships i think you're absolutely right yeah yeah i agree 100 percent uh, with that yeah yeah have you really been listening to the episode or has your monkey mind been taking you off in one direction or another our mental habits can be our biggest assets or our biggest liabilities as we pursue certain goals for me the biggest performance gains have always come from training my mind in my book, Mindful Landlord, I talk about how you can train your mind and how you can apply some of these strategies to your journey in the real estate field. The book is available on Amazon and also on its website, mindfullandlord.com. Now I'll stop evangelizing for the power of mental training and let you get back to the show. Um. All right, uh, I'm gonna ask you another question, which is, 
what do you think we should be talking about that we're not talking about? So us who are in this industry, we, you know, we have a lot of challenges. We're in mm -hmm. our, you know, in our local markets. What should, what ball should we have our eye on that maybe we don't? Wow. Uh, that, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to throw any uh, other agents or anybody under the bus, but I, I don't like a lot of the uh, marketing tactics and, um, and gimmicks that a lot of agents are using uh, in this area. I'm like, I don't know how they do it there. Um, but, you know, and, but, you know, the client is, is very naive, especially if they haven't uh, bought or sold a property uh, uh, in their lifetime or maybe just very few. Um, so they, they perceive it as, oh, uh, I'll work with this agent because he's got a lot of buyers. Well, guess what? We all have access to the same buyers, right? So that's a, yeah, it's just a fallacy and it, it's it's just a, a mis, misperception and, and a lot of agents use it uh, to, you know, not trick, but at least get give it to their advantage. So, oh, look, I got all these buyers here for your house. Well, if they think about it logically, if they're committed to these buyers, why would you want to hire that person? Because now is there is there a commitment to their buy, to the buyers or is it commitment to you as a seller? Like how are they supposed to get you the best price if they're going to get the best price for their buyer clients, right? It just doesn't make sense to me. So don't hire the, the person who says, oh, I've got a ton of buyers for you uh, because we all have access to the same buyers. It goes on MLS. There's 80,000 plus agents in, in the GTA and all of them see uh, see the listings. So it's not, it's not who has the most buyers. It's who can do the best job for you as a seller, right? Mm -hmm. No, I think that's a, that's a you know a great tip. I, our system works the same way here. We also yeah. have MLS, and you know yeah. all the agents kind of have access to to similar information. But that brings me to another question: What kind of like how should that interview go down? You know, like I, I what I see a lot of is, um, you know, I so I coach people in real estate and okay. uh, in, in investing, and a lot of the time the, the the conversation goes like, yeah, so you know, my sister in law is a broker or my uncle is a broker, and so like you know, I feel bad not using them to mm. purchase this investment property that has nothing to do with any transaction that that person's ever done, and I'm like. Yeah. No, that's kind of not how you need to make that decision. But, yeah. you know, as you, somebody who's like a real insider on this, how do you interview an agent to make sure that they're right for you? Yeah, no, another great question. Uh, I would say put everything in context, right? Um, and this is probably the largest financial transaction you're going to make uh, if it's an investment property. If it's a home for yourself or your family, then there's also, it's probably the largest emotional investment you're going to make, right? Because you're going to live here. So now are you going to trust that to somebody who does this part-time uh, or somebody who just got their license? Oh yeah, my sister-in-law just got her real estate license. I'll use her. Well, is this the first deal she's ever done uh, versus she's done over, you know, hundreds of deals, uh, right? And they know what they're doing. Are you going to trust um, especially in a market, in a down market like we're experiencing now, you want to be able to leverage the experience of that agent to get you the most, uh, you know, return for, for, for your property if you're selling or if you're buying something, you want to make sure that you get a, a good deal uh, going in and not somebody who's just going to uh, wing it or, or, you know, fly by the seat of their pants as their first or second deal kind of thing. Right. So that's what I would say. And, you know, no offense to any beginners out there, but we all have to learn somehow. And uh, we were all I was there at one point, uh, you know, and I learned along the way. I made mistakes, you know, as did every other agent. Uh, so um, it all depends how comfortable that, that is with somebody who uh, are you going to you know, put up with the, the mistakes that they're going to make? Are you willing to risk that uh, for your investments? Uh, or do you want somebody with uh, more experience uh, who's, a, who's a safer bet? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, and, and it's especially with uh, having market specific knowledge. And, you know, yeah. I have this, yeah. uh, I do actually have my broker's license and I do, um, you know, work with some people in the, in the Montreal area, but right. very quickly when someone comes and says, you know, all oh, I'm looking at this piece of land, like, you know, in the Laurentians two hours outside of Montreal, like, Sure. Should I, you know, can you help me put an offer on this thing? And it's like, well, I mean, I could do it. But ultimately, yeah. you would be better served by someone who has knowledge of septic systems and environmental studies and like that yeah. particular area, because you are going to acquire knowledge 
of that market based on what your practice is. And so like, you know, again, I, I, I use the other example of like, you know, Bob's uncle who comes and <laughs> wants to do a transaction with me on a rental property. And it's like quite yeah. obvious that the person's never read a lease before. And you're kind of right. like, okay, I, you know, I don't know what the quality of the advice that that person's going to get. But I think, like you said, verifying a track record and also verifying that the person is active in that specific market segment that you're working on, because the yeah. things are very technical. Like if you're looking at, I mean, here, let's say, uh, you know, a, a single family home in like, like Laval or Brossard, which would be our equivalents of Mississauga. Like that's one transaction, whereas like a hundred year old triplex or sixplex in, in, you know, the older parts of Montreal, it's not the same thing at all. And so like mm -hmm. having somebody who really understands the market they're working in is, is yeah. essential. Uh, that's crucial. No, I agree with you hundred percent there. Uh, and a lot of agents here, uh, will travel the two hours somewhere else, uh, for a listing or for buyers, uh, et cetera. Um, you know, I, I would rather refer that business to someone local, to a local specialist, uh, unless I'm familiar with the area. Yeah, I work in Mississauga, but I do also do a lot of business in Hamilton. So, I mean, I, I might go to Hamilton, but, you know, further than that, it's, it's, it's tricky because unless I really study the area, but even then, if I research the area, I'm not going to know the nuances, right? I'm not going to know the neighborhood's in and ins and outs right uh so i'm better off i'm be i better serve my clients by by making that referral uh, to another yeah. agent yeah 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 great um all right i think we're coming up to uh, just about the end of the time that we have for this interview is there anything i left out is there anything you absolutely want to talk about that i didn't ask you about uh no you asked me about the book which was great i appreciate that <laughs> thank you um yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure whatever, whatever else there is. Yeah. Um, okay. Maybe I just, maybe by way of a last question, you tell me if you want to pass on this one. Okay. Um, so, you know, what? we had a little chat off camera initially okay. about, um, you know, how so much of Canada's equity is tied up in the Toronto market and mm. us in Montreal, we are, I always say to people here, we're, you know, the tail of a very large dog and the dog mm. is not here. The dog okay. is sitting, you know, whatever, six hours drive away in Toronto. Okay. Um, you told me a little bit about what the, you think the experience is for people who are transacting in that market, but what do you think the implications are for us who are in smaller markets based mm. on what's happening in Toronto? I don't know if you would have any insight on that. Not really, uh, but uh, I liken it to um, the relationship between U.S. and Canada. So U.S. would be the dog and Canada would be the, the, the tail, right? Or vice versa. I'm not sure <laughs> how it works. But usually whatever happens there then eventually happens here, right? So interest rates uh, going up, interest rates going up here. Recession down there, recession over here, right? So it would definitely, it would probably be the same thing on a, on a smaller scale uh, when you talk about Toronto and, and Montreal. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, this is also a conversation like a lot of, you know, people who are active in the market here are like, yeah, Toronto's having like a huge correction and that's not going to come and bite us. And I'm like, well, no, maybe it is, though, because yeah. basically you got to think that Ottawa is setting policy based on what's happening yeah. in Toronto, not based on what's happening in Montreal. And I don't have the statistics in front of me, but I know that between Vancouver and Toronto, I think it's like something like 65 percent of Canada's equity is tied up in those two markets. And so, sure. you know, us who are trying to make sound decisions based on like, you know, some of the macroeconomic conditions of what's going on, we definitely need to be informed about what's happening in those markets because we yeah. ignore them at our own peril. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's a great point that the, the, the policy decisions are nationwide, right? They're Canadian. Yeah. It's not just, uh, you know, Toronto specific, right? So it's definitely going to affect the, the, the smaller markets. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I heard something else. Maybe you can con either confirm or dispel this for me. Um, I've heard that, you know, in the height of the frenzy in Toronto, that uh, there was a lot of dodgy uh, mortgage qualification practices oh, going yes. on. Um, I wonder, yeah. because we really have not had that here because our prices are more in line with people's salaries. Maybe you can just tell me what that yeah. is like a little bit. No, that's true. There was actually a CBC Marketplace report that came out just recently. I think it was last week. Um, so that talked specifically about uh, mortgage fraud uh, and people, you know, uh, falsifying documents in order to be able to purchase a, a property. Th there is there is a lot of that going on. Unfortunately, you know, in our in our area, some parts of our um, of the GTA more so than others, right? And uh, that the CBC Marketplace report exposed that, um, and that makes us all look bad, right? So, um, so when. I think you asked me before about the interview process. So that's another thing to keep in mind. If, if someone is making 
promises that seem too good to be true, uh, you know, take that with a grain of salt because um, it may just be the, trying to lead you down the wrong path. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you only can qualify for a certain amount, but they tell you, oh, no, no worries, we're going to get you into that. Let's say you only qualify for seven hundred thousand uh, and then we'll get you into that eight hundred thousand house. You know, uh, your, your red flags need to go up uh, for that, you know, and uh, and just buy what you can uh, afford legitimately. Uh, don't don't get uh, involved in, in anything like that, because that it's not just could lead to financial um you know, a crisis for you, but it's also illegal. So you might end up uh, in legal trouble for sure. Yeah. 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 No. And I think that's, you know, I think that that's also like a, re a really great point because like, yes, sometimes, you know, we want to stretch and sometimes yeah. people, you know, especially in a market frenzy like that, when you have to put in 200 K over asking, like that's yeah. stretching people's means beyond what they're able to do. But the banking rules are there precisely mm -hmm. because us as individual consumers maybe don't have the experience or the long-term view of what's going on. Like right. I always say, you know, you got to take the insurance company seriously. Like if the insurance company is telling you that it's going to cost $5,000 to insure a 21 year old male on a sports car, yeah. maybe that's because statistically the chances that he does something silly with that sports car are really high. Yeah. And so the bank, when they're qualifying you for a mortgage is making similar decisions. They're looking at your financial capacity based on what can you pay if, something happens That's and if right. you suddenly you know fiddle around with uh, you know the engine of the motorcycle to make it go twice as fast are you really sure that you're you can control it because the bank doesn't think you can and maybe yeah. they know something you don't so. no 100 percent. And, and uh one good thing about that uh, in canada we're very prudent when it comes to lending and financial practices which has saved us uh in, in times where the u.s was not as prudent uh, and they were hit hard uh, during the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. Whereas here in Canada, it was less of a blow because uh, because we were taking those those uh, those approaches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you have any sense for the uh, size of mortgage fraud that that happened over the last two years in Toronto? Like, do would you have a percentage to put on that of how many things were qualified under false pretenses? I have I have literally no idea. Um, I'm not involved in that. I don't want to be involved in that. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, and, I, and and full disclosure, I didn't even watch the. The, um, the marketplace report yet I was planning to uh, but I was away last week and I said okay I'll, I'll watch it when I come back um, so but you reminded me so thanks uh, I'll definitely check it out it may there may be mention of how how large it is but who knows I, I only know in some pockets it's 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 more of a problem than in other pockets and some of the areas that I work in yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we'll be sure to drop the link to that uh, in the show notes. So Lambros, thank you for joining me today. Um, where can our audience reach out to you if they want to learn more about what you do or pick up your book? Yeah, by all means. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm trying to grow my Instagram following. So if you don't mind, if you're on Instagram, by all means, uh, you know, follow me there. Uh, I'll follow you back. Uh, it's at Demos Real Estate. Uh, or, um, you can go to my website, demosrealestate.ca. So it's the same name, Demos Real Estate. Uh, and from there, there's links to all my social media channels. Uh, my phone number's there. You know, you can email me, whatever. I'm old school. So, you know, if you want to call me or text me, I'm happy to, to chat uh, with you there too. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, where is your book available? Uh, it's on Amazon right now. Uh, I'll give you the link. Uh, and that way, maybe you can post it uh, as well. Uh, there's a Canadian uh, version and also a, a US version. So if, uh, if your listeners happen to be in the US, uh, they can uh, uh, go to amazon.com. Um, if you're in Canada, you can go to amazon.ca. And it, I should mention that it's free for a limited time uh, today. Uh, and for the next few days, it'll be free. The e-version will be free. The paperback you can get at cost, uh, but that's going to go up, uh, obviously. So jump on it in the next uh, day or two. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, that's a that's a great uh, giveaway or takeaway that people can take from uh, this sure. uh, interview. All right. Well, thank you, Lambros. And uh, thank to everybody you, else. I appreciate Have a great it. Rest of the week. Thank you, Terry. Great.